Book Three, Chapter Three of the Wanderer's Necklace by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three, The Valley of the Dead Kings. Martina and I had made a plan. Polka, after much coaxing, took us with her one evening when she went to place the accustomed offerings in the Valley of the Dead indeed at first she refused outright to allow us to accompany her because she said only those who were born in the village of kurna had made such offerings since the days when the pharaohs ruled and that if strangers shared in this duty it might bring misfortune we answered however that if so the misfortune would fall on us the intruders also we pointed out that the jars of water and milk were heavy and as it happened there was no one from the hamlet to help carry them this night having weighed these facts polka changed her mind well she said it is true that i grow fat and after laboring all day at this and that have no desire to bear burdens like an ass so come if you will and if you die or evil spirits carry you away do not add yourself to the number of the ghosts of whom there are too many hereabouts and blame me afterwards on the contrary i said we will make you our heirs and i laid a bag containing some pieces of money on the table polka who was a saving woman took the money for i heard it rattle in her hand hung the jars about my shoulders and gave martina the meat and corn in a basket the flat cakes however she carried herself on a wooden trencher because as she said she feared lest we should break them and anger the ghosts who liked their food to be well served so we started and presently entered the mouth of that awful valley which martina told me looked as though it had been riven through the mountain by lightning strokes and then blasted with a curse up this dry and desolate place which she said was bordered on either side by walls of grey and jagged rock we walked in silence only i noted that the dog which had followed us from the house clung close to our heels and now and again whimpered uneasily the beast sees what we cannot see, whispered Polka in explanation. At last we halted, and I set down the jars at her bidding upon a flat rock which she called the table of offerings. See, she exclaimed to Martina, those that were placed here three days ago are all emptied and neatly piled together by the ghosts. I told Hoder that they did this, but he would not believe me now let us pack them up in baskets and be gone for the sun sets and the moon rises within the half of an hour i would not be here in the dark for ten pieces of pure gold then go swiftly polka i said for we bide here this night are you mad she asked not at all i answered a wise man once told me that if one who is blind can but come face to face with a spirit he sees it and thereby regains his sight if you would know the truth, that is why I have wandered so far from my own country, to find some land where ghosts may be met. Now I am sure that you are mad, exclaimed Polka. Come, Hilda, and leave this fool to make trial of his cure for blindness. Nay, answered Martina, I must stay with my uncle, although I am very much afraid. If I did not, he would beat me afterwards. Beat you? Hoder beat a woman? oh you are both mad or perhaps you are ghosts also i have thought it once or twice who at least am sure that you are other than you seem holy jesus this place grows dark and i tell you it is full of dead kings may the saints guard you at the least you'll keep high company at your death farewell whate'er befalls blame me not who warned you and she departed at a run the empty vessels rattling on her back and the dog yapping behind her when she had gone the silence grew deep now martina i whispered find some place where we may hide whence you can see this table of offerings she led me to where a fallen rock lay within a few paces and behind it we sat ourselves down in such a position that martina could watch the table of offerings by the light of the moon here we waited for a long while it may have been two hours or three or four at least i knew that although i could see nothing the solemnity of that place sank into my soul i felt as though the dead were moving about me in the silence 
i think it was the same with martina for although the night was very hot in that stifling airless valley she shivered at my side at last i felt her start and heard her whisper i see a figure it creeps from the shadow of the cliff towards the table of offerings what is it like i asked it is a woman's figure draped in white clothes she looks about her she takes up the offerings and places them in a basket she carries it is a woman no ghost for she drinks from one of the jars oh now the moonlight shines upon her face it is that of heliodore i heard and could restrain myself no longer leaping up i ran towards i knew the table of offerings to be i tried to speak but my voice choked in my throat the woman saw or heard me coming through the shadows at least uttering a low cry she fled away for i caught the sound of her feet on the rocks and sand then i tripped over a stone and fell down in a moment martina was at my side truly you are foolish olaf she said did you think that the lady heliodore would know you at night changed as you are in this garb that you must rush at her like an angry bull now she is gone and perchance we shall never find her more why did you not speak to her because my voice choked within me oh blame me not martina if you knew what it is to love as i do and after so many fears and sorrows i trust that i should know also how to control my love broke in martina sharply come waste no more time in talk let us search then she took me by the hand and led me to where she had last seen heliodore she has vanished away she said here is nothing but rock it cannot be i answered oh that i had my eyes again if for an hour i who was the best tracker in jutland see if no stone has been stirred martina the sand will be damper where it has lain she left me and presently returned i have found something she said when heliodore fled she still held her basket which from the look of it was last used by the pharaohs at least one of the cakes has fallen from or through it come she led me to the cliff and up it to perhaps twice the height of a man then round a projecting rock here is a hole she said such as jackals might make perchance it leads into one of the old tombs whereof the mouth is sealed it was on the edge of the hole that i found the cake therefore doubtless heliodore went down it now what shall we do follow i think where is it nay i go first give me your hand olaf and lie upon your breast i did so and presently felt the weight of martina swinging on my arm leave go she said faintly like one who is afraid i obeyed though with doubt and heard her feet strike upon some floor thanks be to saints all is well she said for aught i knew this hole might have been as deep as that in the chamber of the pit let yourself down it feet first and drop tis but shallow i did so and found myself beside martina now in the darkness you are the better guide she whispered lead on i'll follow holding your robe so i crept forward warily and safely as the blind can do till presently she exclaimed halt there is light again i think that the roof of the tomb for by the paintings on the walls such it must be has fallen in it seems to be a kind of central chamber out of which run great galleries that slope downward and are full of bats ah one of them is caught in my hair olaf i will go no further i fear bats more than ghosts or anything in this world now i considered a while till a thought struck me on my back was my beggar's harp i unslung it and swept its cords and wild and sad they sounded in that solemn place then i began to sing an old song that twice or thrice i had sung with heliodore in byzantium this song told of a lover seeking his mistress it was for two voices since in the song the mistress answered verse for verse here are those of the lines that i remember or rather the spirit of them rendered into english i sang the first verse and waited dear maid of mine i bide my strings beat on thy shrine with music's wings palace or cell a shrine i see if there thou dwell and answer me there was no answer so i sang the second verse and once more waited 
on thy love's fire my passion breathes wind of desire thy incense wreathes greeting to thee or soon or late i bond or free am dedicate and from somewhere far away in the recesses of that great cave came the answering strophe o oh, love sublime and undismayed no touch of time upon thee laid that that is thine ended the quest i seek my shrine upon thy breast then i laid down the harp at last a voice the voice of heliodore speaking whence i knew not asked do the dead sing or is it a living man and if so how is that man named a living man i replied and he is named olaf son of thorvald or otherwise michael that name was given him in the cathedral at byzantium where first his eyes fell on a certain heliodore daughter of magus the egyptian whom now he seeks i heard the sounds of footsteps creeping towards me and heliodore's voice say let me see your face you who name yourself olaf for know that in these haunted tombs ghosts and visions and mocking voices play strange tricks why do you hide your face you who call yourself olaf because the eyes are gone from it heliodore irene robbed it of the eyes from jealousy of you swearing that never more should they behold your beauty perchance you would not wish to come too near to an eyeless man wrapped in a beggar's robe she looked i felt her look she sobbed i heard her sob and then her arms were about me and her lips were pressed upon my own so at length came joy such as i cannot tell the joy of lost love found again a while went by how long i know not and at last i said where is martina it is time we left this place martina she exclaimed do you mean irene's lady and is she here if so how comes she to be travelling with you olaf as the best friend man ever had heliodore as one who clung to him in his ruin and saved him from a cruel death as one who has risked her life to help him in his desperate search and without whom that search had failed then may god reward her olaf for i did not know there were such women in the world lady martina where are you lady martina thrice she cried the words and at the third time an answer came from the shadows at a distance i am here said martina's voice with a little yawn i was weary and have slept while you two greeted each other well met at last lady heliodore see i have brought you back your olaf blind it is true but otherwise lacking nothing of health in strength and station then heliodore ran to her and kissed first her hand and next her lips in after days she told me that for those of one who had been sleeping the eyes of martina seemed to be strangely wet and red but if this were so her voice trembled not at all truly you two should give thanks to god she said who has brought you together again in so wondrous a fashion as i do on your behalf from the bottom of my heart yet you are still hemmed round by dangers many and great what now olaf will you become a ghost also and dwell here in the tomb with heliodore and if so what tale shall i tell to palka and the rest not so i answered i think it will be best that we should return to kurna heliodore must play her part as the spirit of a queen till we can hire some boat and escape with her down the nile never she cried i cannot i cannot having come together we must separate no more oh olaf you do not know what a life has been mine during all these dreadful months when i escaped from musa by stabbing the eunuch who was in charge of me for which hideous deed may i be forgiven and i felt her shudder at my side i fled i knew not whither till i found myself in this valley where i hid till the night was gone then at daybreak i peeped out of the mouth of the valley and saw moslems searching for me but as yet a long way off also now i knew this valley it was that to which my father had brought me as a child when he came to search for the burying place of his ancestor the pharaoh which records he had read told him was here i remembered everything 
where the tomb should be, how we had entered it through a hole, how we had found the mummy of a royal lady whose face was covered with a gilded mask, and on her breast the necklace which I wear. I ran along the valley, searching the left side of it with my eyes, till I saw a flat stone which I knew again. It was called the Table of Offerings. I was sure that the hole by which we had entered the tomb was quite near to this stone, and a little above it, in the face of a cliff, I climbed. I found what seemed to be the hole, though of this I could not be certain. I crept down it till I came to an end, and then, in my terror, hung by my hands and dropped into the darkness, not knowing whither I fell, or caring over much if I were killed. As it chanced, it was but a little way, and finding myself unhurt, I crawled along the cavern till I reached this place where it is light, for here the roof of the cave has fallen in. While I crouched amid the rocks, I heard the voices of the soldiers above me, heard their officer also bidding them bring ropes and torches. To the left of where you stand there is a sloping passage that runs down to the great central chamber where sleeps some mighty king, and out of this passage open other chambers. Into the first of these the light of the morning sun struggles feebly. I entered it, seeking somewhere to hide myself, and saw a painted coffin lying on the floor near to the marble sarcophagus from which it had been dragged. It was that in which we had found the body of my ancestress. But since then thieves had been in this place. We had left the coffin in the sarcophagus and the mummy in the coffin, and replaced their lids. Now the mummy lay on the floor, half unwrapped and broken in two beneath the breast. Moreover, the face, which I remembered as being so like my own, was gone to dust, so that there remained of it nothing but a skull, to which hung tresses of long black hair, as indeed you may see for yourself. By the side of the body was the gilded mask with the black and staring eyes, and the painted breastpiece of stiff linen, neither of which the thieves had found worth stealing. I looked, and a thought came to me. Lifting the mummy, I thrust it into the sarcophagus, all of it save the gilded mask and the painted breastpiece of stiff linen. Then I laid myself down in the coffin, of which the lid, still lying crosswise, hid me to the waist, and drew the gilded mask and painted breastpiece over my head and bosom. Scarcely was it done when the soldiers entered, by now the reflected sunlight had faded from the place, leaving it in deep shadow, but some of the men held burning torches made from splinters of old coffins that were full of pitch. "'Feet have passed here. I saw the marks of them in the dust,' said some officer. "'She may have hidden in this place. Search! Search! It will go hard with us if we return to Musa to tell him that he has lost his toy.' They looked into the sarcophagus and saw the broken mummy. Indeed, one of them lifted it, unwilling enough, and let it fall again, saying, grimly, Musa would scarce care for this companion, though in her day she may have been fair enough. Then they came to the coffin. Here's another, exclaimed the soldier, and one with a gold face. Allah, how its eyes stare! Pull it out, said the officer. "'Let that be your task,' answered the man. "'I'll defy myself with no more corpses.' The officer came and looked. "'What a haunted hole is this, full of the ghosts of idol worshippers, "'Or so I think,' he said, "'those eyes stare curses at us. "'Well, the Christian maid is not here. "'On, before the torches fail.' Then they went, leaving me. The painted linen creaked upon my breast as I breathed again. Till nightfall I lay in that coffin, fearing lest they should return, and I tell you, Olaf, that strange dreams came to me there, for I think I swooned or slept in that narrow bed. Yes, dreams of the past, which you shall hear one day, if we live, for they seem to have to do with you and me. I, I thought that the dead woman in the sarcophagus at my side awoke and told them to me. At length I rose and crept back to this place where we stand, for here I could see the friendly light, and being outworn, laid me down and slept. At the first break of day I crawled from the tomb, followed that same road by which I had entered, though I found it hard to climb up through the entrance hole. No living thing was to be seen in the valley, 
except a great night-bird flitting to its haunt i was parched with thirst and knowing that in this dry place i soon must perish i glided from rock to rock towards the mouth of the valley thinking to find some other grave or cranny where i might lie hid till night came again and i could descend to the plain and drink but olaf before i had gone many steps i discovered fresh food milk and water laid upon a rock and though i feared lest they might be poisoned ate and drank of them when i knew that they were wholesome i thought that some friend must have set them there to satisfy my wants though i knew not who the friend could be afterwards i learned that this food was an offering to the ghosts of the dead among our forefathers in forgotten generations it was i know the custom to make such offerings since in their blindness they believed that the spirits of their beloved needed sustenance as their bodies once had done doubtless the memory of the rite still survives at least to this day the offerings are made indeed when it was found that they were not made in vain more and more of them were brought so that i have lacked nothing here then i have dwelt for many moons among the dust of men departed only now and again wandering out at night once or twice folk have seen me when i ventured into the plains and i have been tempted to speak to them and ask their help but always they fled away believing me to be the ghost of some bygone queen indeed to speak truth olaf this companionship with spirits for spirits do dwell in these tombs i have seen them i tell you i have seen them has so worked upon my soul that at times i feel as though i were already of their company moreover i knew that i could not live long the loneliness was sucking up my life as the dry sand sucks water had you not come olaf within some few days or weeks i should have died now i spoke for the first time saying and did you wish to die heliodore no before the war between musa and my father magas news came to us from byzantium that irene had killed you all believed it save i who did not believe why not heliodore because i could not feel that you were dead therefore i fought for my life who otherwise after we were conquered and ruined and my father was slain fighting nobly should have stabbed not that eunuch but myself then later in this tomb i came to know that you were not dead the other lost ones i could feel about me from time to time but you never you who would have been the first to seek me when my soul was open to such whisperings so i lived on when all else would have died because hope burned in me like a lamp unquenchable and at last you came oh at last you came end of chapter three book three chapter four of the wanderer's necklace by h rider haggard this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four the caliph harun here there is an absolute blank in my story one of those walls of oblivion of which i have spoken seems to be built across its path it is as though a stream had plunged suddenly from some bright valley into the bosom of a mountainside and there vanished from the ken of man what happened in the tomb after heliodore had ended her tale whether we departed thence together or left her there a while how we escaped from kurna and by what good fortune or artifice we came safely to alexandria i know not as to all these matters my vision fails me utterly so far as i am concerned they are buried beneath the dust of time i know as little of them as i know of where and how i slept between my life as olaf and this present life of mine that is nothing at all yet in this way or in that the stream did win through the mountain since beyond all grows clear again once more i stood upon the deck of the diana in the harbour of alexandria with me were martina and heliodore heliodore's face was stained and she was dressed as a boy such a harlequin lad as singers and mountebanks often take in their company the ship was ready to start and the wind served 
yet we could not sail because of the lack of some permission a muslim galley patrolled the harbour and threatened to sink us if we dared to weigh without this paper the mate had gone ashore with a bribe we waited and waited at length the captain menace who stood by me whispered into my ear be calm he comes all is well then i heard the mate shout i have the writing under seal and menace gave the order to cast off the ropes that held the ship to the quay one of the sailors came up and reported to menace that their companion cosmas was missing it seemed that he had slipped ashore without leave and had not returned there let him abide said menace with an oath doubtless the hog lies drunk in some den when he awakes he may tell what tale he pleases and find his own way back to lesbos cast off cast off i say at this moment that same cosmos appeared i could not see him but i could hear him plainly enough evidently he had become involved in some brawl for an angry woman and others were demanding money of him and he was shouting back drunken threats a man struck him and the woman got him by the beard then his reason left him altogether am i a christian to be treated thus by you heathen dogs he screamed oh you think i am dirt beneath your feet i have friends i tell you i have friends you know not whom i serve i say that i am a soldier of olaf the northman olaf the blind olaf red sword he who made you prophet worshippers sing so small at mitaline as he will do again ere long indeed friend said a quiet voice it was that of the Moslem captain, Yusuf, he who befriended us when we arrived at Alexandria, who had been watching all this scene. Then you serve a great general, as some of us have cause to know. Tell me, where is he now, for I hear that he has left Lesbos. Where is he? Why, aboard yonder ship, of course. Oh, he has fooled you finely. Another time you'll search beggars' rags more closely. Cast off! Cast off! roared Menace. Nay, said the officer, cast not off. Soldiers, drive away those men. I must have words with the captain of this ship. Come, bring that drunken fellow with you. Now all is finished, I said. Yes, answered Heliodore all is finished after we have endured so much it is hard well at least death remains to us hold your hand exclaimed martina god still lives and can save us yet black bitterness took hold of me in some few days i had hoped to reach lesbos and there be wed to heliodore and now and now cut the ropes menace i cried and out with the oars we'll risk the galley you martina set me at the mouth of the gangway and tell me when to strike though i be blind i may yet hold them back while we clear the quay she obeyed and i drew the red sword from beneath my rags then amidst the confusion which followed i heard the grave voice of yusuf speaking to me sir he said for your own sake i pray you put up that sword which we think is one whereof tales have been told to fight is useless for i have bowmen who can shoot you down and spears that can outreach you general olaf a brave man should know when to surrender especially if he be blind ay sir i answered and a brave man should know when to die why should you die general went on the voice i do not know that for a christian to visit egypt disguised as a beggar will be held a crime worthy of death unless indeed you came hither to spy out the land can the blind spy asked martina indignantly who can say lady but certainly it seems that your eyes are bright and quick enough also there is another matter a while ago when this ship came to alexandria 
i signed a paper giving leave to a certain eyeless musician and his niece to ply their trade in egypt then there were two of you now i behold a third who is that comely lad with a stained face that stands beside you heliodore began some story saying that she was the orphan son of i forget whom and while she told it certain of the moslems slipped past me truly you should do well in the singing trade interrupted the officer with a laugh seeing that for a boy your voice is wondrous sweet are you quite sure that you remember your sex aright well it can be easily proved bear that lad's bosom soldiers nay tis needless snatch off that head-dress a man obeyed and heliodore's beautiful black hair which i would not suffer her to cut fell tumbling to her knees let me be she said i admit that i am a woman that is generous of you lady the officer answered in the midst of the laughter which followed now will you add to your goodness by telling me your name you refuse then shall i help you in the late coptic war it was my happy fortune twice to see a certain noble maiden the daughter of magus the prince whom the emir musa afterwards took for himself but who fled from him tell me lady have you a twin sister cease your mockings sir said heliodore despairingly i am she you seek tis musa seeks you not i lady then sir he seeks in vain for know that ere he finds i die oh sir i know you have a noble heart be pitiful and let us go i'll tell you all the truth olaf redsword yonder and i have been long affianced blind though he is he sought me through great dangers ay and found me would you part us at the last in the name of the god we both worship and of your mother i pray you let us go by the prophet that i would do lady only then i fear that i should let my head go from its shoulders also there are too many in this secret for it to bide there long if i did as you desire nay you must to the emir all three of you not musa but to his rival obidala who loves him little and by the decree of the caliph once again rules egypt be sure that in a matter between you and musa you will meet with justice from obidala come now fearing nothing to where we may find you all garments more befitting to your station than those mummers robes so a guard was formed around us and we went as my feet touched the quay i heard a sound of angry voices followed by groans and a splash in the water what is that i asked of yusuf i think general that your servants from the diana have settled some account that they had with the drunken dog who was so good as to bark out your name to me but with your leave i will not look to make sure god pardon him as yet i cannot i muttered and marched on we stood whether on that day or another i do not know in some hall of judgment martina whispered to me that a small dark man was seated in the chair of state and about him priests and others this was the emir obidala musa that had been emir who she said was fat and sullen was there also and whenever his glance fell upon heliodor i felt her shiver at my side so was the patriarch politian who pleaded our cause the case was long so long that being courteous as ever they gave us cushions to sit on also in an interval food and sherbet musa claimed heliodor as his slave an officer who prosecuted claimed that allah having given me their enemy and a well-known general who had done them much damage into their hands i should be put to death politian answered on behalf of all of us saying that we had harmed no man he added that there was a truce between the christians and the moslems i could not be made to suffer the penalties of war in a time of peace who had come to egypt but to seek a maid to whom i was affianced moreover that even if it were so the murder of prisoners was not one of those penalties the emir listened to all but said little 
at length however he asked whether we were willing to become moslems since if so he thought that we might go free we answered that we were not willing then it would seem he said that the lady heliodore having been taken in war must be treated as a prisoner of war the only question being to whom she belongs now musa interrupted angrily shouting out that as to this there was no doubt since she belonged to him who had captured her during his tenure of office the emir thought a while and we waited trembling at last he gave judgment saying the general olaf the blind who in byzantium was known as olaf red sword or as michael and who while in the service of the empress irene often made war against the followers of the prophet but who afterwards lost his eyes at the hands of this same evil woman is a man of whom all the world has heard particularly have we moslems heard of him seeing that as governor of lesbos in recent days he inflicted a great defeat upon our navy slaying many thousands and taking others prisoner but as it chances god who bides his time to work justice set a bait for him in the shape of a fair woman on this bait he has been hooked notwithstanding all his skill and cunning and delivered into our hands having come into egypt disguised as a beggar in order to seek out that woman still as he is so famous a man and as at present there is a truce between us and the empire of the east which truce raises certain doubtful points of high policy i decree that this case be remitted to the caliph harun al rashid my master and that he be conveyed to baghdad there to await judgment with him will go the woman whom he alleges to be his niece but who as we are informed was one of the waiting ladies of the empress irene against her there is nothing to be said save that she may be a byzantine spy now i come to the matter of the lady heliodore who is reported to be the wife or the lover or the affianced of this general olaf a question of which god alone knows the truth this lady heliodore is a person of high descent and ancient race she is the only child of the late prince magas who claimed to have the blood of the old pharaohs in his veins and who within this year was defeated and slain by my predecessor in office the emir musa the said emir having captured the lady heliodore purposed to place her in his harem as he had a right to do seeing that she refused the blessings of the faith as it chanced however she escaped from him as it is told by stabbing the eunuch in charge of her at least it is certain that this eunuch was found dead though by whom he was killed is not certain now that she has been taken again the lord musa claims the woman as his spoil and demands that i should hand her over to him yet it seems to me that if she is the spoil of any one she belongs to the emir governing egypt at the date of her recapture it was only by virtue of his office as emir and not by gift purchase or marriage contract that the lord musa came into possession of her which possession was voided by her flight before she was added to his household and he acquired any natural rights over her in accordance with our law now for my part i as emir make no claim to this woman holding it a hateful thing before god to force one into my household who has no wish to dwell there especially when i know her to be married or affianced to another man still as here also are involved high questions of law i command that the lady heliodore daughter of the late prince magus shall also be conveyed with all courtesy and honour to the caliph harun at baghdad there to abide his judgment of her case the matter is finished let the officers concerned carry out my decree and answer for the safety of these prisoners with their lives the matter is not finished shouted the ex emir musa you obidala have uttered this false judgment because your heart is black towards me whom you have displaced then appeal against it said obidala but know that if you attempt to lay hands upon this lady 
my orders are that you be cut down as an enemy to the law patriarch of the christians you sail for baghdad to visit the caliph at his request in a ship that he has sent for you into your hands i give these prisoners under guard knowing that you will deal well with them who are of your false faith to you also who have the caliph's ear allah knows why i will entrust letters making true report of all this matter let proper provision be made for the comfort of the general olaf and of those with him musa may your greetings at the court of baghdad be such as you deserve meanwhile cease to trouble me at the door of that hall i was separated from heliodore and martina and led to some house or prison where i was given a large room with servants to wait upon me here i slept that night and on the morrow asked when we sailed for beirut on our way to baghdad the chief of the servants answered that he did not know during that day i was visited by yusuf the officer who had captured us on board the diana he also told me that he did not know when we sailed but certainly it would not be for some days further he said that i need have no fear for the lady heliodore and martina as they were well treated in some other place then he led me into a great garden where he said i was at liberty to walk whenever i pleased thus began perhaps the most dreadful time of waiting and suspense in all this life of mine seeing that it was the longest every few days the officer yusuf would visit me and talk of many matters for we became friends only of heliodore and martina he could or would tell me nothing nor of when we were to set out on our journey to baghdad i asked to be allowed to speak with the patriarch politian but he answered that this was impossible as he had been called away from alexandria for a little while nor could i have audience with the emir obidala for he too had been called away now my heart was filled with terrors for i feared lest in this way or in that heliodore had fallen into the hands of the accursed musa i prayed yusuf to tell me the truth of the matter whereon he swore by the prophet that she was safe but would say no more nor did this comfort me much since for aught i knew he might mean she was safe in death i was aware further that the moslems held it no crime to deceive an infidel week was added to week and still i languished in this rich prison the best of garments and food were brought to me i was even given wine kind hands tended me and led me from place to place i lacked nothing except freedom and truth doubt and fear preyed upon my heart till at length i fell ill and scarcely cared to walk in the garden one day when yusuf visited me i told him that he would not need to come many more times since i felt that i was going to die do not die he answered since then perchance you will find you have done so in vain and he left me on the following evening he returned and told me that he had brought a physician to see me a certain mahomed who was standing before me although i had no hope from any physician i prayed this mahomed to be seated whereon yusuf left us closing the door behind him be pleased to set out your case general olaf said mahomed in a grave quiet voice for know that i am sent by the caliph himself to minister to you how can that be seeing that he is in baghdad i answered still i told him my ailments when i had finished he said i perceive that you suffer more from your mind than from your body be so good now as to repeat to me the tale of your life of which i have already heard something tell me especially of those parts of it which have to do with the lady heliodore daughter of magus of your blinding by irene for her sake and of your discovery of her in egypt where you sought her disguised as a beggar why should i tell you all my story sir that i may know how to heal you of your sickness also general olaf i will be frank with you 
I am more than a mere physician. I have certain powers under the caliph's seal, and it will be wise on your part to open all your heart to me. Now I reflected that there could be little harm in repeating to this strange doctor what so many already knew, so I told him everything, and the tale was long. Wondrous! most wondrous said the grave-voiced physician when i had finished yet to me the strangest part of your history is that played therein by the lady martina had she been your lover now one might have understood perhaps and he paused sir physician i answered the lady martina has been and is no more than my friend ah now i see new virtues in your religion since we Moslems do not find such friends among those women who are neither our mothers nor our sisters. Evidently the Christian faith must have power to change the nature of women, which I thought to be impossible. Well, General Olaf, I will consider of your case, and I may tell you that I have good hopes of finding a medicine by which it can be cured, all save your sight, which in this world God himself cannot give back to you. Now I have a favor to ask. I see that in this room of yours there is a curtain hiding the bed of the servant who sleeps with you. I desire to see another patient here, and that this patient should not see you. Of your goodness will you sit upon the bed behind that curtain, and will you swear to me on your honor as a soldier that whatever you may hear you will in no way reveal yourself? Surely. That is, if it is nothing which will bring disgrace upon my head or name. It will be nothing to bring disgrace on your head or name, General Olaf, though perhaps it may bring some sorrow to your heart. As yet I cannot say. My heart is too full of sorrow to hold more, I answered. Then he led me down to the guard's bed on which I sat myself down, being strangely interested in this play. He drew the curtain in front of me, and I heard him return to the center of the room and clap his hands. Someone entered, saying, "'Hi, Lord, your will?' "'Silence!' he exclaimed, and began to whisper orders, while I wondered what kind of a physician this might be who is addressed as, "'Hi, Lord!' The servant went, and after a while of waiting that seemed long, once more the door was opened, and I heard the sweep of a woman's dress upon the carpet. "'Be seated, lady,' said the grave voice of the physician, "'for I have words to say to you.' "'Sir, I obey,' answered another voice, at the sound of which my heart stood still. It was that of Heliodore. "'Lady,' went on the physician, "'as my robe will tell you, I am a doctor of medicine.' Also, as it chances, I am something more, namely an envoy appointed by the Caliph Harun al-Rashid, having full powers to deal with your case. Here are my credentials, if you care to read them, and I heard a crackling as of parchment being unfolded. Sir, answered Heliodore, I will read the letters later. For the present I accept your word. Only I would ask one question, if it pleases you to answer. Why have not I and the General Olaf been conveyed to the presence of the Caliph himself, as was commanded by the Emir Obidala? Lady, because it was not convenient to the Caliph to receive you, since, as it chances, at present he is moving from place to place upon the business of the state. Therefore, as you will find in the writing, he has appointed me to deal with your matter. Now, Lady, the Caliph and I his servant, know all your story from lips which even you would trust you are betrothed to a certain enemy of his a northman named olaf redsword or michael who was blinded by the empress irene for some offence against her but was afterwards appointed by her son constantine to be governor of the isle of lesbos this olaf by the will of god inflicted a heavy defeat upon the forces of the caliph which he had sent to take lesbos then, by the goodness of God, he wandered to Egypt in search of you, with the result that both of you were taken prisoner. 
lady it will be clear to you that having this wild hawk olaf in his hands the caliph would scarcely let him go again to prey upon the moslems though whether he will kill him or make of him a slave as yet i do not know nay hear me out before you speak the caliph has been told of your wondrous beauty and as i see even less than the truth also he has heard of the high spirit which you showed in the coptic rising when your father the prince magus was slain and of how you escaped out of the hand of the emir musa the fat and were not afraid to dwell for months alone in the tombs of the ancient dead now the caliph being moved in his heart by your sad plight and all that he has heard concerning you commands me to make you an offer the offer is that you should come to his court and there be instructed for a while by his learned men in the truths of religion then if it pleases you to adopt islam he will take you as one of his wives and if it does not please you will add you to his harem since it is not lawful for him to marry a woman who remains a christian in either case he will make on you a settlement of property to the value of that which belonged to your father the prince magus reflect well before you answer your choice lies between the memory of a blind man whom i think you will never see again and the high place of one of the wives of the greatest sovereign of the earth sir before i would answer i would put a question to you why do you say the memory of a blind man because lady a rumour has reached me which i desired to hold back from you but which now you force me to repeat it is that this general olaf has in truth already passed the gate of death then sir she answered with a little sob it behooves me to follow him through that gate that will happen when it pleases god meanwhile what is your answer sir my answer is that i a poor christian prisoner a victim of war and fate thank the caliph harun al-rashid for the honours and the benefits he would shower on me and with humility decline them so be it lady the caliph is not a man who would wish to force your inclination still this being so i am charged to say he bids you remember that you were taken prisoner in war by the emir musa he holds that subject to his own prior right which he waives you are the property of the emir musa under a just interpretation of the law yet he would be merciful as god is merciful and therefore he gives you a choice of three things the first of these is that you adopt islam with a faithful heart and go free that i refuse as i have refused it before said heliodore the second is he continued that you enter the harem of the emir musa that i refuse also and the third and last is that having thrust aside his mercy you suffer the common fate of a captured Christian who persists in error and die. That I accept, said Heliodore. You accept death. In the splendor of your youth and beauty, you accept death, he said with a note of wonder in his voice. Truly you are great-hearted, and the caliph will grieve when he learns his loss as I do now yet i have my orders for which my head must answer lady if you die it must be here and now do you still choose death yes she said in a low voice behold this cup he went on and this draught which i pour into it and i heard the sound of liquid flowing presently i shall ask you to drink of it and then after a little while say the half of an hour you will fall asleep to wake in whatever world god has appointed to the idol worshippers of the cross you will suffer no pain and no fear indeed maybe the draught will bring you joy then give it me said heliodore faintly i will drink at once and have done then it was that i came out from behind my curtain and groped my way towards them 
sir physician or sir envoy of the caliph harun i said but for the moment went no further since with a low cry heliodore cast herself upon my breast and stopped my lips with hers hush till i have spoken i whispered placing my arm about her then continued i swore to you just now that i would not reveal myself unless i heard aught which would bring disgrace on my head or name to stand still beyond yonder curtain while my betrothed is poisoned at your hands would bring disgrace upon my head and name so black that not all the seas of all the world could wash it away say physician does yonder cup hold enough of death for both of us yes general olaf and if you choose to share it i think the caliph will be glad since he loves not the killing of brave men only it must be now and without more words you can talk for a little afterwards before the sleep takes you so be it i said since i must die as i heard you decree but now it is no crime to die thus or at least i'll risk it who have one to guard upon that road drink beloved a little less than half since i am the stronger then give me the cup husband i pledge you she said and drank thrusting the cup into my hand i too lifted it to my lips lo it was empty oh most cruel of thieves i cried you have stolen all i she answered shall i see you swallow poison before my eyes i die but perchance god may save you yet not so heliodore i cried again and turning began to grope my way to the window place which i knew was far from the ground since i had no weapon that would serve my turn in an instant as i thrust the lattice open i felt two strong arms cast about me and heard the physician exclaim come lady help me with this madman lest he do himself a mischief she seized me also and we struggled together all three of us the doors burst open and i was dragged back to the centre of the room olaf redsword the blind general of the christians said the physician in a new voice one that was full of majesty and command i who speak to you am no doctor of medicine and no envoy i am harun al-rashid caliph of the faithful is it not so my servants it is so caliph pealed the answer from many throats hearken then to the decree of harun al-rashid learn both of you that all which has passed between us was but a play that i have played to test the love and faithfulness of you twain lady heliodore be at ease you have drunk nothing save water distilled with roses and no sleep shall fall on you save that which nature brings to happiness lady i tell you that having seen what i have seen and heard what i have heard rather would i stand in the place of that blind man to-night than be sovereign of the east truly i knew not that love such as yours was to be met within the world i say that when i saw you drain the cup in a last poor struggle to drive back the death that threatened this olaf my own heart went out in love for you yet have no fear since my love is of a kind that would not rob you of your love but rather would bring it to a rich and glorious blossom in the sunshine of my favour wondrous is the tale of the wooing of you twain and happy shall be its end general olaf you conquered me in war and dealt with those of my servants who fell into your hands according to the nobleness of your heart shall i then be outdone in generosity by one whom a while ago i should have named a christian dog not so let the high priest of the christians politian be brought hither he stands without and with him the lady named martina who was the empress irene's waiting woman the messenger went and there followed a silence there are times when the heart is too full for words at least heliodore and i found nothing to say to each other we only clasped each other's hand and waited at length the door opened and i heard the eager 
bustling steps of politian also another gliding step which i knew for that of martina she came to me she kissed me on the brow and whispered into my ear so all is well at last as i knew it would be and now olaf and now olaf you are about to be married yes at once and i wish you joy her words were simple enough yet they kindled in my heart a light by which it saw many things martina i said if i have lived to reach this hour under god it is through you martina they say that each of us has a guardian angel in heaven and if that be so mine has come to earth yet in heaven alone shall i learn to thank her as i ought then suddenly martina was sobbing on my breast after which i remember only that heliodore helped me to wipe away her tears while in the background i heard the caliph say to himself in his deep voice wondrous wondrous by allah these christians are a strange folk how far wiser is our law for then he could have married both of them and all three would have been happy truly he who decreed that it should be so knew the heart of man and woman and was a prophet sent by god nay answer me not my friend politian since on matters of religion we have agreed that we will never argue do your office according to your unholy rites and i and my servants will watch praying that the evil one may be absent from the service oh silence silence have i not said that we will not argue on the subject of religion to your business man so politian drew us together to the other end of the chamber and there wed us as best he might with martina for witness and the solemn moslems for congregation when it was over harun commanded my wife to lead me before him here is a marriage gift for you general olaf he said one i think that you will value more than any other and he handed me something sharp and heavy i felt it hilt and blade and knew it for the wanderer's sword yes my own red sword from which i took my name that the commander of the faithful now restored to me and with it my place and freedom i took it and saying no word with that same sword gave to him the triple salute due to a sovereign instantly i heard harun's scimitar the scimitar that was famous throughout the east rattle as it left its scabbard as did the scimitars of all those who attended on him and knew that there was being returned to me the salute which a sovereign gives to a general in high command then the caliph spoke again a wedding gift to you lady heliodore child of an ancient and mighty race a new-made wife of a gallant man for the second time to-night take this cup of gold but let that which lies within it adorn your breast in memory of Harun. Queens of old have worn those jewels, but never have they hung above a nobler heart. Heliodore took the cup, and in her trembling hand I heard the priceless gems that filled it clink against its sides. Once more the caliph spoke. A gift for you also, Lady Martina. Take this ring from my hand and place it on your own. It seems a small thing, does it not? Yet something lies within its circle. In this city I saw today a very beauteous house built by one of your Grecian folk, and behind it lands that a swift horse could scarcely circle twice within an hour, most fruitful lands fed by the waters. That house and those lands are yours, together with rule over all who dwell upon them there you may live content with whomever you may please even if he be a christian free of tax or tribute provided only that neither you nor he shall plot against my power now to all three of you farewell perchance for ever unless some of us should meet again in war general olaf your ship lies in the harbour use it when you will i pray that you will think kindly of harun al rashid as he does of you olaf red sword come let us leave these two lady martina 
I pray you to be my guest this night. So they all went, leaving Heliodore and myself alone in the great room. Yes, alone, at last, and safe. End of chapter 4 Book 3, Chapter 5 of The Wanderer's Necklace by H. Ryder Haggard This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 Irene's Prayer Years had gone by, I know not how many, but only that much had happened in them. For a while, Irene and young Constantine were joint rulers of the empire. Then they quarreled again, and Constantine, afraid of treachery, fled with his friends in a ship after an attempt had been made to seize his person. He purposed to join his legions in Asia, or so it was said, and make war upon his mother. But those friends of his upon the ship were traitors, who, fearing Irene's vengeance, or perhaps his own, since she threatened to tell him all the truth concerning them, seized Constantine and delivered him up to Irene. She, the mother who bore him, caused him to be taken to the purple porphyry chamber in the palace, that chamber in which, as the firstborn of an emperor, he saw the light, and there robbed him of light for ever. Yes, Staratius and his butchers blinded Constantine, as I had been blinded. Only it was told that they drove their knives deeper, so that he died. But others say that he lived on, a prisoner unknown, unheeded, as those uncles of his whom he had blinded, and who were once in my charge had lived, till in Greece the assassins' daggers found their hearts. If so, oh, what a fate was his! Afterwards, for five years, Irene reigned alone in glory, while Storatius, my godfather, and his brother eunuch, Aetius, strove against each other to be first minister of the crown. Aetius won, and not content with all he had, plotted that his relative, Nicetus, who held the place of captain of the guard, which once I filled, should be named successor to the throne. Then at last the nobles rebelled, and electing one of their number, Nicephorus, as emperor, seized Irene in her private house of Eleutherius, where she lay sick, and crowned Nicephorus in St. Sophia. Next day he visited Irene, when, fearing the worst and broken by illness, she bought a promise of safety by revealing to him all her hoarded treasure. Thus fell Irene, the mighty empress of the Eastern Empire. Now during all these years Heliodor and I were left in peace at Lesbos. I was not deposed from my governorship of that isle, which prospered greatly under my rule. Even Irene's estates, which Constantine had given me, were not taken away. At the appointed times I remitted the tribute due, yes, and added to the sum, and received back the official acknowledgment signed by the Empress, and with it the official thanks. But with these never came either letter or message. Yet it is evident she knew that I was married, for to Heliodore did come a message, and with it a gift. The gift was that necklace, and those other ornaments which Irene had caused to be made in exact likeness of the string of golden shells separated by the emerald beetles, one half of which I had taken from the grave of the wanderer at Ar, and the other half of which was worn by Heliodore. So much of the gift. The message was that she who owned the necklace might wish to have the rest of the set. To it were added the words that a certain general had been wrong when he prophesied that the wearing of his necklace by any woman, save one, would bring ill fortune to the wearer, since from the day it hung about Irene's neck even that which seemed to be bad fortune had turned to good. Thus she had escaped the most evil thing in the world, namely another husband, and had become the first woman in the world. These words, which were written on a piece of sheepskin, sealed up and addressed to the Lady Heliodore, but unsigned, I thought of the most evil omen, since boastfulness always seems to be hateful to the power that decrees our fates, and so indeed they proved to be. On a certain day in early summer, 
it was the anniversary of my marriage in egypt heliodore and i dined with but two guests those guests were jode the great northman my lieutenant and his wife martina for within a year of our return to lesbos jode and martina had married it comes back to me that there was trouble about the business but that when jode gave out that either she must marry him or that he would sail back to his northern land bidding good-bye to us all for ever martina gave way i think that heliodore managed the matter in some fashion of her own after the birth of our first-born son how i held it best never to inquire at least it was managed and the marriage turned out well enough in the end although at first martina was moody at times and somewhat sharp of tongue with jode then they had a baby which died and this dead child drew them closer together than it might have done had it lived at any rate from that time forward martina grew more gentle with jode and when other children were born they seemed happy together well we four had dined and it comes to me that our talk turned upon the caliph harun and his wonderful goodness to us whom as christians he was bound to despise and hate heliodore told me then for the first time how she was glad he made it clear so soon that what she drank from the golden cup which now stood upon our table was no more than rose water so strong is the working of the mind that already she had begun to feel as though poison were numbing her heart and clouding her brain and was sure that soon she would have fallen into the sleep which harun had warned her would end in death had he been a true physician he would have known that this might be so and that such grim jests are very dangerous i said then i added for i did not wish to dwell longer upon a scene the memory of which was dreadful to me although it had ended well tell us martina is it true that those rich possessions of yours in alexandria which the caliph gave you are sold yes olaf she answered to a company of greek merchants and not so ill the contract was signed but yesterday it was my wish that we should leave lesbos and go to live in this place as we might have done with safety under harun's sign firman but jode here refused i said jode in his big voice am i one to dwell among moslems and make money out of trade and gardens in however fine a house why i should have been fighting with these prophet worshippers within a month and had my throat cut moreover how could i bear to be separated from my general and whatever she may think how could martina bear to lose sight of her godson why olaf i tell you that although you are married and she is married she still thinks twice as much of you as she does of me oh blind man's dog once blind man's dog always look not so angry martina why i wonder does the truth always make women angry and he burst into one of his great laughs at this moment heliodore rose from the table and walked to the open window place to speak to our children and martinez a merry company who were playing together in the garden here she stood a while studying the beautiful view of the bay beneath and then of a sudden called out a ship a ship sailing into the harbour and it flies the imperial standard then pray god she brings no bad news i said who feared that imperial standard and felt that we had all been somewhat too happy of late moreover i knew that no royal ship was looked for from byzantium at this time and dreaded lest this one should bear letters from the new emperor dismissing me from my office or even worse tidings what bad news should she bring growled jode oh i know what is in your mind general but if this upstart Deciphorus is wise, he'll leave you alone, since Lesbos does not want another governor, and will tell him so, if there be need. Yes, it will take more than one ship of war, I and more than three, to set up another governor in Lesbos. Nay, rebuke me not, General, for I at least have sworn no oath of homage to this Nicephorus, nor have the other Northmen or the men of Lesbos. You are like a watchdog, Jode barking at you know not what just because it is strange go now i pray you to the quay and bring back to us news of this ship 
so he went and for the next two hours or more i sat in my private room dictating letters to heliodore on matters connected with the duties of my office the work came to an end at last and i was preparing to take my evening ride on a lead mule when martina entered the room do you ride with us tonight, martina i asked recognizing her step no olaf she said quickly nor i think can you here are letters from you from byzantium jode has brought them from the ship where is jode i said without in the company of the captain of the ship some guards and a prisoner what prisoner perchance the letters will tell you she replied evasively have i your command to open and read they are marked most secret i nodded since martina often acted as my secretary in high matters being from her training skilled in such things so she broke the seals and read to myself and to heliodore who also was present in the room as follows to the excellent michael a general of our armies and governor of the isle of lesbos greetings from nicephorus by the will of god emperor know o michael that we the emperor reposing a special faith in you our trusted servant with these letters deliver into your keeping a certain prisoner of state this prisoner is none other than irene who aforetime was empress because of her many wickednesses in the sight of god and man we by the decree of the people of the army of the senate and of the high offices of state amidst general rejoicing deposed the said irene widow of the emperor leo and mother of the late emperor constantine and placed ourselves upon the throne the said irene at her own request we consigned to the place called the island of princes setting her in charge of certain holy monks whilst there abusing our mercy and confidence she set on foot plots to murder our person and repossess herself of the throne now our counsellors with one voice urged that she should be put to death in punishment of her crimes but we being mindful of the teaching of our lord and saviour and of his saying that we should turn the other cheek to those who smite us out of our gentle pity have taken another counsel learn now most excellent michael the blind who once were known as olaf redsword that we hand over to your keeping the person of irene aforetime empress charging you to deal with her as she dealt with you and as she dealt also with the late emperor constantine the son of her body for thus shall her evil plottings be brought to naught by god's name he means that i must blind her i exclaimed making no answer martina went on with the letter should the said irene survive her just punishment we command you to make sufficient provision for her daily wants but no more and to charge the same against the sum due us from the revenues of lesbos should she die at once or at any future time give to her decent private burial and report to us the circumstances of her death duly attested keep these presents secret and do not act upon them until the ship which brings them and the prisoner to you has sailed for byzantium which it is ordered to do as soon as it has been revictualled on your head be it to carry out these our commands for which you shall answer with your life and those of your wife and children this signed and sealed at our court of byzantium on the twelfth day of the sixth month of the first year of our reign and countersigned by the high officers whose names appear beneath such was this awful letter that having read martina thrust into my hand as though she would be rid of it then followed a silence which at length martina broke your commands excellency she said in a dry voice i understand that the the prisoner is in the ante-room in charge of the captain jode then let her remain in the charge of the captain jode i exclaimed angrily and in your charge martina who are accustomed to attending upon her and know that you are both answerable for her safety with your lives send the captain of the ship to me and prepare a discharge for him i will not see this woman till he has sailed since until then i am commanded to keep all secret send also the head officer of the guard three days went by the imperial ship had sailed taking with her my formal acknowledgment of the emperor's letter 
and the time had come when once more I must meet Irene face to face. I sat in the audience chamber of my great house, and there was present with me only Jode, my lieutenant in office. Being blind, I dared not receive a desperate woman alone, fearing lest she might stab me or do herself some mischief. At the door of the chamber, Jode took her from the guards, whom he bade remain within call, and conducted her to where I sat. He told me afterwards that she was dressed as a nun, a white hood half hiding her still beautiful face and a silver crucifix hanging upon her breast. As I heard her come, I rose and bowed to her, and my first words to her were to pray her to be seated. Nay, she answered in that rich, well-remembered voice of hers. A prisoner stands before the judge. I greet you, General Olaf. I pray your pardon, Michael, after long years of separation. You have changed but little, and I rejoice to see that your health is good, and that the rank and prosperity which I gave have not been taken from you. I greet you, madam. Almost had I said Augusta. I answered, then continued hurriedly. Lady Irene, I have received certain commands concerning you from the Emperor Nicephorus, which it is best that you should hear, so that you shall hold me quit of blame in aught that it may be my duty to inflict upon you. Read them, Captain Jode. Nay, I forgot you cannot. Give the copy of the letter to the Lady Irene. The original she can see afterwards, if she wills. So the paper was given to her by Jode, and she read it aloud, weighing each word carefully. "'Oh, what a dog is this!' she said when it was finished. "'No, Olaf, that of my free will I surrendered the throne to him, yes, and all my private treasure, he swearing upon the Gospels that I should live in peace and honour till my life's end, and now he sends me to you to be blinded, and then done to death, for that is what he means. Oh, may God avenge me upon him. May he become a byword and a scorn, and may his own end be even worse than that which he has prepared for me. May shame wrap his memory as in a garment. May his bones be dishonoured and his burying be forgotten. Ay, hey, so it shall be. Note. The skull of this Nicephorus is said to have been used as a drinking cup by his victorious enemy, the King Crumb. Editor. End of note. She paused in her fearful curse, then said in a new voice, that voice in which she was wont to plead, You will not blind me, Olaf. You'll not take from me my last blessing, the light of day. Think what it means. The General Olaf should know well enough, interrupted Jode, but I waved him to be silent and answered, "'Tell me, madam, how can I do otherwise? "'It seems to me that my life and that of my wife and children "'hang upon this deed. "'Moreover, why should I do otherwise? "'Now that by God's justice the wheel has come round at last,' "'I added, pointing to the hollows beneath my brows "'where my eyes once had been. "'Oh, Olaf,' she said, "'if I harmed you, you know well it was because I loved you. "'Then God send that no woman ever loves me in such a fashion.' broke in jode olaf she continued taking no note of him once you went very near to loving me also on that night when you would have eaten the poison figs to save my son the emperor at least you kissed me if you forget me i cannot olaf can you blind a woman whom you have kissed kissing takes two and i know that you blinded him muttered jode for i crucified the brutes you commanded to do the deed to which they confessed "'Olaf, I admit that I treated you ill. "'I admit that I would have killed you. "'But believe me, it was jealousy and not but jealousy which drove me on. "'Almost as soon would I have killed myself. "'Indeed, I thought of it.' "'And there the matter ended,' said Jode. "'It was Olaf who walked the hall of the pit, not you. "'We found him on the brink of the hole. "'Olaf, after I regained my power, "'by blinding your own son,' said Jode, for which you will have an account to settle one day. I dealt with you, knowing that you had married my rival, for I kept myself informed of all you did. Still I lifted no hand against you. What good was a maimed man to you when you were courting the Emperor Charlemagne? asked Jode. Now at last she turned on him, saying, Well is it for you, barbarian, that if only for a while fate has reft power from my hands. Oh, this is the bitterest drop in all my cup. 
that i who for a score of years ruled the world must live to suffer the insults of such as you then why not die and have done asked the imperturbable jove or if you lack the courage why not submit to the decree of the emperor as so many have submitted you to your decree instead of troubling the general here with prayers for mercy it would serve as well jode i said i command you to be silent this lady is in trouble attack those in power if you will not those who have fallen there speaks the man that i loved said irene what perverse fate kept us apart olaf had you taken what i offered by now you and i would have ruled the world perhaps madam yet it is right i should say that i do not regret my choice although because of it i can no longer look upon the world i know i know she of that accursed necklace which i see you still wear came between us and spoiled everything now i'm ruined for lack of you and you are nobody for lack of me a soldier will run his petty course and depart into the universal darkness leaving never a name behind him in the ages to be what man will take count of one of a score of governors of the little isle of lesbos who might yet have held the earth in the hollow of his hand and shone a second caesar in its annals oh what a marplot of a devil rules our destinies he who fashioned those golden shells upon your breast or so i think well well it is so and cannot be altered the augusta of the empire of the east must plead with the man who rejected her for sight or rather for her life you understand do you not olaf that letter is a command to you to murder me just such a command as you gave to those who blinded your son constantine muttered jode beneath his breath that is what is meant you are to murder me and olaf i am not fit to die great place brings great temptations and i admit that i have greatly sinned i need time upon the earth to make my peace with heaven and if you slay my body now you will slay my soul as well oh be pitiful be pitiful olaf you cannot kill the woman who has lain upon your breast it is against nature if you did such a thing you'd never sleep again you would shatter yourself over the edge of the world being what you are no pomp or power would ever pay you for the deed be true to your own high heart and spare me see i who for so long was the ruler of many kingdoms kneel to you and pray you to spare me and casting herself down upon her knees she laid her head upon my feet and wept all that scene comes back to me with a strange and terrible vividness although i had no sight to aid me in its details save the sight of my soul i remember that the wonder and horror of it pierced me through and through the stab of the dagger in my eyes was not more sharp there was i olaf a mere gentleman of the north seated in my chair of office and there before me her mighty head bowed upon my feet knelt the empress of the earth pleading for her life in truth all history could show few stranger scenes what was i to do if i yielded to her piteous prayers it was probably that my own life and those of my wife and children would pay the price yet how could i clap my hands in their eastern fashion and summon the executioners to pierce those streaming eyes of hers rise augusta i said for in this extremity of her shame i gave her back her title and tell me you who are accustomed to such matters how can i spare you who deal with the lives of others as well as with my own i thank you for that name she said as she struggled to her feet i've heard it shouted by tens of thousands in the circus and from the throats of armies but never yet has it been half so sweet to me as now from lips that have no need to utter it in times bygone i'd have paid you for this service with the province but now irene is so poor that like some humble beggar woman she can but give her thanks still repeat it no more for next time it will sound bitter what did you ask how could you save me was it not well the thing seems simple in all that letter from nicephorus there is no direct command that you should blind me 
the fellow says that you are to treat me as i treated you and as i treated constantine the emperor because i must well i imprison both of you imprison me and you fulfil the mandate he says that if i die you are to report it which shows that he does not mean that i must die oh the road of escape is easy should you desire to travel it if you do not so desire then olaf i pray you as a last favour not to hand me over to common men i see that by your side still hangs that red sword of yours wherewith once i threatened you when you refused me at byzantium draw it olaf and this time i'll guide its edge across my throat so you will please nicephorus and win the rewards that irene can no longer give baptized in her blood what earthly glory is there to which you might not yet attain you who had dared to lay hands upon the anointed flesh that even her worst foes have feared to touch lest god's sudden curse should strike them dead so she went on pouring out words with a strange eloquence that she could command at times till i grew bewildered she who had lived in light and luxury who had loved the vision of all bright and glorious things was pleading for her sight to the man whom she had robbed of sight that he might never more behold the young beauty of her rival she who had imagination to know the greatness of her sins was pleading to be spared the death she dared not face she was pleading to me who for years had been her faithful soldier the captain of her own guard sworn to protect her from the slightest ill me upon whom for a while it had pleased her to lavish the wild passion of her imperial heart who once had almost loved who indeed had kissed her on the lips my orders were definite i was commanded to blind this woman and to kill her in the blinding which in truth i who had the power of life and death i who ruled over this island like a king by virtue of the royal commission could do without question asked if i failed to fulfil these orders i must be prepared to pay the price as if i did fulfil them i might expect a high reward probably the governorship of some great province of the empire this was no common prisoner she was the ex-empress a mighty woman to whom tens of thousands or perhaps millions still looked for help and leadership it was necessary to those who had seized her place and power that she should be rendered incapable of rule it was desirable to them that she should die yet so delicately were the scales poised between them and the adherents of irene among whom were numbered all the great princes of the church that they themselves did not dare to inflict mutilation or death upon her they feared lest it should be followed by a storm of wrath that would shake Nicephorus from his throne and involve them in his ruin. So they sent her to me, the governor of a distant dependency, the man whom they knew she had wickedly wronged, being certain that her tongue, which it was said could turn the hearts of all men, would never soften mine. Then afterwards they would declare that the warrant was a forgery, that I had but wreaked a private vengeance upon an ancient foe, and to still the scandal degrade me from my governorship into some place of greater power and profit oh while irene pleaded before me and heedless of the presence of jode even cast her arms about me and laid her head upon my breast all these things passed through my mind in its scales i weighed the matter out and the beam rose against me for i knew that if i spared irene i condemned myself and those who were more to me than myself my wife my children and all the northmen who clung to me and who would not see me die without blow struck i understood it all and understanding of a sudden made up my mind to spare irene come what might i would be no butcher i would follow my heart whithersoever it might lead me cease madam i said i have decided jode bid the messenger summon hither heliodore and martina my wife and yours oh exclaimed irene if these women are to be called in counsel on my case all is finished seeing that both of them love you and are my enemies moreover i have some pride left to you i could plead but not to them though they blind me with their bodkins after they have stabbed me with their tongues excellency a last boon call in your guard and kill me 
Madam, I said that I had decided, and all the women in the world will not change my mind in this way or in that. Jode, do my bidding. Jode struck a bell, once only, which was the signal for the messenger. He came and received his orders. Then followed a pause, since Heliodor and Martina were in a place close by and must be sent for. During this time, Irene began to talk to me of sundry general matters. She compared the view that might be seen from this house in Lesbos to that from the terrace of her palace in the Bosphorus, and described its differences to me. She asked me as to the Caliph Harun al-Rashid, whom she understood I had seen, inquiring as to the estimate I had formed of his character. Lastly, with a laugh, she dwelt upon the strange vicissitudes of life. "'Look at me,' she said. "'I began my days as the daughter of a Greek gentleman, with no dower save my wit and beauty. Then I rose to be a ruler of the world, and knew all that it has to give of pomp and power.' Nations trembled at my nod. At my smile men grew great. At my frown they faded into nothingness. Save you, Olaf. None ever really conquered me until I fell in the appointed hour. And now, of this splendor there is left but a nun's robe. Of this countless wealth but one silver crucifix. Of this power, not. So she spoke on, still not knowing to what decision I had come. Whether she were to be blinded, or to live, or die, to myself I thought it was a proof of her greatness thus turn her mind to such things while fate hovered over her, its hand upon a sword. But it may be that she thought thus to impress me, and to enmesh me in memories which would tie my hands, or even from the character of my answers, to draw some augury of her doom. The women came at length, Heliodor entered first, and to her Irene bowed. Greeting, lady of Egypt, she said. Ah, had you taken my counsel in the past, that title might have been yours in very truth, and there you and your husband could have founded a new line of kings, independent of the empire which totters to its fall. I remember no such counsel, madam, said Heliodor. It seems to me that the course I took was right, and one pleasing to God, since it has given me my husband for myself, although it is true, wickedly robbed of his eyes. For yourself, can you say so while Martina is always at his side? she asked in a musing voice. Well, it may be, for in this world strange things happen. She paused, and I heard both Heliodor and Jode move as though in anger, for her bitter shaft had gone home. Then she went on softly. Lady, may I tell you that in my judgment your beauty is even greater than it was, though it is true it has grown from bud to flower. Few bear their years and a mother's burden so lightly in these hot lands. Heliodor did not answer, for at that moment Martina entered. Seeing Irene for the first time, she forgot everything that had passed and curtsied to her in the old fashion, murmuring the familiar words, Thy servant greets thee, Augusta. "'Nay, use not that title, Martina, to one who is done with the world and its vanities. Call me mother, if you will, for that is the only name of honour by which those of my religious order may be known. In truth, as your mother in God, I welcome you, and bless you, from my heart for giving you those ills which you have worked against me, being, as I know well, driven by a love that is greater than any woman bears to woman. But that eating fire of passion scorned, is the heritage of both of us, and of it we will talk afterwards. I must not waste the time of the General Olaf, whom destiny, in return for many griefs, has appointed to be my jailer. Oh, Olaf, she added with a little laugh, some foresight of the future must have taught me to train you for the post. Let us then be silent, ladies, and listen to the judgment which this jailer of mine is about to pass upon me. Do you know it is no less than whether these eyes of mine which you were wont to praise, Martina, which in his lighter moments even this stern Olaf was wont to praise, should be torn from beneath my brow. And if so, whether it should be done in a fashion that I die of the deed? That and no less is the matter which his lips must settle. Now speak, Excellency. Madam, I said slowly, 
to the best of my wit i have considered the letter sent to me under the seal and sign of the emperor nicephorus although it might be so interpreted by some i cannot find in that letter any direct command that i should cause you to be blinded but only one that i should keep you under strict guard giving you such things as are necessary to your sustenance this then i shall do and by their first ship make report of my action to the emperor at byzantium now when she heard these words at length the proud spirit of irene broke god reward you for i cannot olaf she cried god reward you saint among men who can pay back cruel injuries with gentlest mercy so saying she burst into tears and fell senseless to the ground martina ran to her aid but heliodore turned to me and said in her tender voice this is worthy of you olaf and i would not have you do otherwise yet husband i fear that this pity of yours has signed the death warrant of us all so it proved to be though as it chanced that warrant was never executed i made my report to byzantium and in course of time the answer came in a letter from the emperor this letter coldly approved of my act in set and formal phrases it added that the truth had been conveyed publicly to those slanderers of the emperor who announced that he had caused irene to be first blinded and then put to death in lesbos whereby their evil tongues had been silenced then came this pregnant sentence we command you with your wife and children and your lieutenant the captain jode with his wife and children to lay down your offices and report yourselves with all speed to us at our court in byzantium that we may confer with you on certain matters if this is not convenient to you or you can find no fitting ship in which to sail at once know that within a month of your receipt of this letter our fleet will call at lesbos and bring you and the others herein mentioned to our presence that is a death sentence said martina when she had finished reading out this passage i have seen several such sent in my day when i was irene's confidential lady it is a common form we shall never reach byzantium olaf or if we do shall never leave it more i nodded for i knew that this was so then at some whispered word from martina heliodore spoke husband she said foreseeing this issue martina jode and most of the northmen and i have made a plan which we will now submit to you praying that for our sakes if not for yours you will not thrust it aside we have bought two good ships armed them and furnished them with all things needful moreover during the past two months we have sold much of our property turning it into gold this is our plan that we pretend to obey the order of the emperor but instead of heading for byzantium sail away north to the land in which you were born where having rank and possession you may still become a mighty chief if we all go at once we shall miss the imperial fleet and i think that none will follow us now i bowed my head for a while and thought then i lifted it and said so let it be no other road is open for my own sake i would not have stirred an inch i could have gone to the court of the emperor at byzantium and there argued out the thing in a gambler's spirit prepared to win or prepared to lose there at least i should have had all the image worshippers who adored irene that is the full half of the empire upon my side and if i perished i should perish as a saint but a wife and children are the most terrible gifts of god if the most blessed for they turn our hearts to water so for the first time in my life i grew afraid and for their sakes fled as might be expected having martina's brains heliodore's love and the northman's loyalty at the back of it our plan went well a letter was sent to the emperor saying that we would await the arrival of the fleet to obey his commands having some private matters to arrange before we left lesbos then on a certain evening we embarked on two great ships about four hundred souls in all before we went i bade farewell to irene she was seated outside the house that had been given to her employed in spinning for it was her fancy to earn the bread she ate by the labour of her hands round her were playing jode's children and my own 
whom in order to escape suspicion we had sent thither till the time came for us to embark since the people of lesbos only knew of our scheme by rumour whither do you go olaf she asked back to the north whence i came madam i answered to save the lives of these and i waved my hand towards the children if i bide here all must die we have been sent for to byzantium as i think you were wont to send for officers who had ceased to please you i understand olaf moreover i know it is i who have brought this trouble upon you because you spared me whom it was meant that you should kill also i know through friends of mine that henceforth for reasons of policy my little end of life is safe and perhaps with it my sight all this i owe to you though now at times i regret that i asked the boon from the lot of an empress to that of a spinning wife is a great change and one which i find it hard to bear still i have my peace to make with god and towards that peace i strive yet will you not take me with you olaf i should like to found a nunnery in that cold north of yours no augusta i have done my best by you and now you must guard yourself we part for ever i go hence to finish where I began. My birthplace calls me. Forever is a long word, Olaf. Are you sure that we part forever? Perchance we shall meet again in death or in other lives. Such, at least, was the belief of some of the wisest of my people before we became Christian, and mayhap the Christians do not know everything, since the world had learned much before they came. I hope that it may be so, Olaf, for I owe you a great debt and would repay it to you full measure, pressed down and running over. Farewell, take with you the blessings of a sinful and a broken heart. And rising, she kissed me on the brow. Here ends the story of this life of mine, as Olaf Redsword. Since of it I can recover no more, the darkness drops. Of what befell me and the others after my parting with Irene, I know nothing or very little. Doubtless we sailed away north, and I think came safely to Ar, since I have faint visions of Aduna the fair grown old, but still unwed, for the stain of Steinar's blood, as it were, still marked her brow in all men's eyes, and even of Fredisa, white-haired and noble-looking. How did we meet, and how did we separate at last, I wonder? And what were the fates of Heliodor and of our children, of Martina and of Jod? Also was the prophecy of Odin, spoken through the lips of Fredisa in the temple at Ar, that he and his fellow gods, or demons, would prevail against my flesh and that of those who clung to me, fulfilled at last in the fires of martyrdom for the faith, and his promise of my happiness was fulfilled? I cannot tell, I cannot tell. Darkness entombs us all, and history is dumb. At R there are many graves, standing among them not so long ago. Much of this history came back to me. End of Book 3, Chapter 5 Read by Annie Hill End of The Wanderer's Necklace by H. Ryder Haggard